I'm Master Chief Mark Hakala. I spent 30 years in the Navy, but I've spent my whole life being intrigued by naval customs, traditions, history, heritage, and uniforms. So I'd like to share some of that enthusiasm with you using some items in my personal collection to get us started. Let's see what's in the sea chest today. Taps. Easily the most recognizable American bugle call. And the only one that has the ability to fill people's hearts with emotion. Maybe you've seen this email that comes around periodically that tells the story of how Taps began. 1862, during the Civil War, Union Army Captain Robert Ellicombe was with his men near Harrison's Landing, Virginia. Confederate Army was on the other side of a narrow strip of land. During the night, Captain Ellicombe heard the moans of a soldier who lay severely wounded out on the field. Not knowing if it was a Union or a Confederate soldier, the captain decided to risk his life and bring the stricken man back for medical attention. Crawling on his stomach through the gunfire, the captain reached the stricken soldier and began pulling him toward the encampment. When the captain finally reached his own lines, he discovered it was a Confederate soldier, but the soldier was dead. The captain lit a lantern and suddenly caught his breath and went numb with shock. In the dim light, he saw the face of the soldier. It was his own son. The boy had been studying music in the South when the war broke out, and without telling his father, he enlisted in the Confederate Army. The following morning, heartbroken, the father asked permission from his superiors to give his son a full military burial despite his enemy's status. His request was only partially granted. The captain had asked if he could have a group of army band members play a funeral dirge for his son at the funeral, and the request was turned down since the soldier was a Confederate. But, out of respect for the father, they did say they could give him only one musician. The captain chose a bugler. He asked the bugler to play a series of musical notes he'd found on a piece of paper in the pocket of the dead youth's uniform. The wish was granted. The haunting melody we now know as Taps, used at military funerals, was born. That's a hell of a story. But there's a problem. There is no Captain Robert Ellicombe listed in the muster rolls of any unit that was at Harrison's Landing in July 1862. And there's no listing of a Confederate named Ellicombe in the muster rolls of any regiment that was at Harrison's Landing in July 1862. And it was almost unheard of to go into no man's land to retrieve wounded when armies were in line of battle. There's a notable exception. Sergeant Richard Kirkland of the 2nd South Carolina Regiment loaded himself up with canteens and left his unit's defenses and gave water to wounded Union soldiers in front of his lines at Fredericksburg on December 14, 1862. There's a statue of him there that was done by the sculptor Felix de Weldon, who was also responsible for doing the Iwo Jima statue at the Marine Corps War Memorial in Arlington. And the chances of there being gunfire at night for the captain to have to crawl through, pretty slim. Unless there was some way to be able to see what you were shooting at, so you definitely wouldn't have lit a lantern. And, when in line of battle, doing a full honors funeral for anybody, much less an enlisted man, much less the enemy, that was just unheard of. So in short, that's right, this story is 100% bull cookies. This story was completely made up 
by Robert Ripley for his short-lived Ripley's Believe It or Not TV show in 1949. The story was even printed in newspapers, and even though they did retractions for it, it comes up now and again on the internet and gets blasted around, and if you haven't seen it, at some point you probably will. So then, what is the real story? For part of the story, we actually can go to 1862. We actually can go to Harrison's Landing, Virginia, during the Peninsula Campaign. But there's some extra parts that we'll cover. Let's start with Dan Butterfield. Brigadier General Daniel Butterfield commanded 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps of the Union Army of the Potomac. Butterfield was not regular army. In fact, before the war, he had worked for a company that had been founded by his father, along with two gentlemen named Wells and Fargo. And that company was, you guessed it, American Express. One of Butterfield's claims to fame is that he created the system of core badges that were worn by soldiers in the Union Army. These are the forerunners of the modern U.S. Army's division patches that are worn to this very day. During the Peninsula Campaign in 1862, at the Battle of Gaines Mill, Butterfield's heroism stood out. In the midst of battle, he saw that one of his regiments, the 83rd Pennsylvania, was starting to falter. And even though he was wounded himself, he grabbed their colors and rallied the regiment and kept the unit from breaking. For this, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. And here you can actually see his Medal of Honor. Something else he did was he actually wrote his own bugle call. He wrote it as a preparatory call to be sounded before the next one so that everybody in his brigade knew that that call was for them and them alone. And here's how it sounded. <laughs> His soldiers put words to it, Dan, 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 Butterfield, Butterfield. Unless they were upset with him, in which case they would say, Damn, Damn, Dan, Butterfield, Butterfield. At this time in military history, drums and bugles were referred to in the army as field music. Most regiments had a band, but they also had field music. It's because they had two different purposes. One was for music, for marching, for entertainment, for various other things. But field music, that was communication of orders. That was like your radio man nowadays. That was a way to be able to communicate your commands that could be heard above the din of battle. By the time you get into the Civil War, there are a bunch of different military manuals that have been written. And different units are following different ones. They have a lot of similarities, but they also have their own differences. One of the major ones that was in use for decades was written in 1835 by Winfield Scott, who at the time of the Civil War was the top general in the Union Army. The next year, in 1836, Samuel Cooper wrote his own book of instructions and regulations. In both of these books, there was a bugle call called Tattoo. The word derives from the Dutch tap two, which means to turn off the taps. Bars closed, got to return to base. This bugle call in both books was pretty much a note-for-note -note ripoff of a French bugle call to extinguish lights, or lights out. This was the final bugle call of the day. This was the word to turn off the lights, go to sleep. It was said that this call was actually Napoleon's favorite bugle call. In camp at the appropriate time, this bugle call would be played, and afterwards, a drummer would sound three distinct individual taps. Every professional soldier had to know all of these bugle calls and drum cadences because these were meant to convey orders. Your life could depend on this. Dan Butterfield was no exception. Even though a newer tattoo had come out in 1855, and it was repeated in yet a different book in 1862, Butterfield had obviously spent all his time learning Scott's tactics from 1835. And to make a long story short, the tattoo bugle call, he just didn't like it. 
So one night at Harrison's Landing, Butterfield sent for a bugler in one of the regiments in his brigade, the 83rd Pennsylvania. That was Oliver Wilcox Norton. Decades after the war, Norton recounted that General Butterfield showed him a musical score that had been written out in pencil on the back of an envelope, and he asked him to sound out the notes, which he did. He did this several times, and Butterfield had Norton change the notes somewhat, making some longer, making some shorter, but basically keeping the same notes in the same order. They went back and forth until Butterfield was satisfied with how the music sounded. Now, Butterfield's own recollections differ somewhat from Norton's. First of all, he said he could not read music. He knew the sounds of all the bugle calls, and again, he had created his own bugle call, but it was just by telling a bugler, make it sound like this. But the rest of the story of the process matches up pretty well with Norton's story. So since Butterfield could not read or write music, what's more likely is that he cracked open, this is my take on it, he cracked open Scott's tactics to the bugle call for tattoo. At this point, let's take a minute to listen to that bugle call, the 1835 Scott tattoo. Pay attention particularly to the notes toward the end of this bugle call. Did you hear it? Now let me play that last part for you again. So here, embedded in Scott's 1835 tattoo, we essentially have all the notes of the tune that we know as Taps today. Now, if you take this music and you follow what Norton said, he changed it somewhat, lengthening some notes and shortening others, but retaining the melody as he first gave it to me. Essentially, if you do that to this music, you get Taps. Butterfield instructed Norton that from then on, use this bugle call as the last call of the day. So that night, Norton sounded it, and the next day he was visited by a bunch of other buglers from other units, saying, that was pretty cool, could I get a copy of the music, which he shared with him. And it pretty much spread like wildfire through the army. It's much shorter than Tattoo, and it definitely has some style about it. After the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, a couple of elements of the Eastern Army were sent out to the Western Theater, and so these buglers took the call with them, and it quickly spread through the Western Armies. So even though this call was not yet listed in any manual, it seems to have been used pretty consistently. Let's take a quick look at the name. 
again going through these various manuals in use up to the Civil War, you see the final bugle call of the day listed as Tattoo. There was one other book in 1861, Elias Howe, who is better known for inventing the sewing machine and less well known for inventing the zipper, published a book on drum and fife instructions for the army. In this book, he also listed bugle calls for infantry, for artillery, and cavalry. At the time, the different branches used different bugle calls for the same thing. One of his cavalry calls was listed as, quote, to extinguish lights, and in parentheses, or taps. This is probably the earliest time that you see taps referred to as a bugle call. Remember, before, it was three drum taps that finished out the day. Some have theorized that going back to the Dutch words tap two that led to tattoo, that's where taps came from, but I think this is probably more likely. Even though it had obviously been around for decades, this bugle call didn't get put into the books until 1891, the Army's infantry drill regulations of that year and the Navy's instructions for infantry and artillery. Now, in both of these books, the name of the bugle call is the English version of the French title to the old bugle call, Extinguish Lights. For the Navy, it's not until 1898 in drill regulations for infantry, artillery, and arm and away boats that you see this bugle call listed with the title of TAPS. TAPS for funerals and memorial services. The person given credit for using TAPS for a funeral for the first time is Captain John Tidball of Battery A, 2nd U.S. Artillery. He'd lost a cannoneer killed in action, and the soldier needed to be buried. Now, as the story goes, at the time it was said that his battery was in an advanced position but concealed in the woods, and he feared that if he fired the traditional three volleys that it would start the fighting back up again. So instead, he ordered that the bugle call for taps be sounded. Tidball may very well have been the first person to order this bugle call to be used for a funeral, but uh, some of the story just doesn't sit right with me. Typically during the Civil War, the dead weren't buried until after the battle was over by personnel detailed for that purpose, and it was a very functional burial. It was only a grave dug deep enough for the body to go into, and usually it was many, many, many bodies that were put into the same grave, usually with no markers. So the idea of a full honors funeral when in line of battle sounds a little sketchy to me. So maybe there's a core of truth to this story, but perhaps some of the details got stretched and a little bit uh, discombobulated over the years. Perhaps there's a much more common sense explanation for using taps at funerals. A universal euphemism for death is sleep. We lay a person to rest, we send them off to their eternal rest, we wish them to rest in peace. So if we're wishing someone to rest in peace, what better way to symbolize it than by playing the bugle call that says lights out and go to sleep, taps. The words to taps. If you look around, you'll probably find a whole bunch of words have been written out to this call. Here's the problem. Taps is not a song. Taps is a bugle call. Taps is a signal. So it would make as much sense to write words to a signal as it would to writing words to the sound that your car's horn makes. So although they might sound nice, they're pretty much afterthoughts. I would like to express my deep gratitude and respect for Yari Villanueva. Yari is a retired U.S. Air Force Master Sergeant. He was with the U.S. Air Force Band, and he played taps heaven only knows how many times at Arlington National Cemetery. For years, he has done research on the history and origin of taps. He has published all this information, and I'll show you his website in the credits at the end of this. I've known of Yari's work for years, and one way or another, much of the source information in this presentation came from Yari's research, and I thank him greatly for that. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.